Excellency. Jacques Maritain described modernity as that time when modern men govern all the problems that torment them. Could you comment on this statement? Uh, okay. First is Jacques Maritain. Um, he was a good philosopher. He was a very good Thomist. But then he, in the 1930s, he went modernist. He, he decided not to lick them any longer. He decided to join them. Perhaps under the influence of his wife, who was a Jewess, who may well have uh, contributed towards um, his turning to the modern world. Uh, so he's not completely, he, he was, uh, at a given point, he was very good. He's not reliable uh, all the time. What was that quote again? Modern men govern all the problems that torment them. That's not true. Absolutely not true. Modern man is not in control of himself, especially. And he has no idea who he is or where he's... Modern man as modern, has, he has no idea who he is, where he's come from, who he's meant to go to. No idea of God. And that he's got no real idea of himself. So how, if he can't know himself, how can he govern all the problems that torment him? On the contrary, he's showing, demonstrating that there's a multitude of problems which torment him and he's got no handle on them. So that, I, I think that's, what, that's not one of the good quotes of, of Marita. As for Kant, now there, that's a big question. That I don't pretend to be an expert in Kant, but I do often talk about him because he's clearly being referred to in the great encyclical of Pius X, an Italian peasant in the best sense of the word. Pius X, Pope St. Pius X, Pope, from 1903 to 1914, just before the First World War. Um, and Pius X, under, as a good peasant, down to earth and with, com and with serious common sense, understood modernism, which is madness. I will come to it. And he nailed modernism in his great encyclical Pascendi of 1907. He became Pope in 1903, and four years later, he tried to, to, to begin with, he tried to deal with the modernists as though they were not men of ill will or not men necessarily opposed to the truth. But he soon found that there was no dealing with them. And therefore, in 1907, after four years, he denounced them in a tremendous document. Of, um, and it's the key to modernism and the key to the problems of the church in the 21st century. So what is Pascendi? Pascendi um, begin, is in the seven main sections. The doctrine is the main part of the encyclical. And the seven parts are the philosopher, the believer, the theologian, the historian, the critic, the reformer, the, the apologist, uh, the historian, the critic, the apologist, the reformer. Those are the seven sections. Maybe not exactly in that order, but largely. But it begins with the philosopher, because what Pius X understood is that modernism is a problem of the mind. It's not a problem of faith, D directly a problem of faith, directly and immediately. It's a problem of a mind, which the mind has let itself into for a lack of faith. But it's essentially a natural problem and not essentially a supernatural problem. Um, it's therefore very basic and uh, it's, it, goes, it goes way outside religion, way beyond religion, so to speak. Um, how can I put it? Uh, and it's a problem of the functioning of the mind. Um, what Kant, Kant is not named in Pascendi, but in a few lines in what is usually the, the fifth or the sixth paragraph of the encyclical, his essential error is laid out in a couple of sentences or one or two sentences. And uh, the essential error is that the mind cannot know the reality behind the appearances. Uh, that this appears to be a microphone. 
It's coloured black with a bit of aluminium colour, aluminium colour at the end. Uh, it stands on a stand. It's there to act as a microphone. It's a microphone. I know by looking at the black and the, uh, the colour of aluminium, it, it, I know it's designed as a microphone. I know what it is. I just I don't know just the black and the aluminium. If that's what it is, it's that colour. Kant says, I know the black, I know the aluminium, I cannot know what the thing is in itself behind the appearances, the ding an sich, the thing in itself. And so he's saying, the mind cannot know the object. What he go goes on to say is that the, uh, the sense appearances come to reach my senses and I can, I can hear the microphone if I tap, tap it. I can feel it, the colour and the temperature. I could taste it if I cared to lick it. it the five, through the five senses, I can see it, uh, that's for sure. Through the five senses come a package of data to my mind and the mind then puts what it wants behind the data. In other words, I can say it looks as though it's black and black and kind of white, therefore it's a cat. What? That's the, the conclusion of Kant's philosophy. I cannot know the real object behind the appearances. I can know the appearances, but I cannot know what's behind the appearances. The, the, behind the Ding an sich, the thing in itself, is unknowable. That's his doctrine. It's insane, because all the time, in fact, I, I, I'm, I'm, my mind is reading, that's why it's called intelligence, it's reading behind the appearances, from the appearances, because the appearances in scholastic philosophy are manifestations of the substance. And therefore, if I want to know the substance, it's enough to know the appearances, because the appearances correspond to the substance, with very rare exceptions. One of those exceptions, of course, is the Holy Eucharist, where the, the reality is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord, but the appearances are still appearances of bread and wine. That's a very exceptional case. Otherwise, the appearances correspond exactly to the substance, and I read... I'm used to reading, I read automatically and without even realizing what I'm doing, I read what the substance is behind the appearances. Now comes the modern philosopher and says, I don't know, I cannot know what, what the object is behind the appearances. And I make up the object, I compose the object behind the appearances. I am the maker of the object. I am the creator of the object. I am the creator Guess who is God? Man. Pius X will say, pride is absolutely the home in modernism because it turns man into the creator. It turns man into the master of every single object. Now, it's a selective uh, misreading of appearances. According to common sense, I will... Can comes down to breakfast, he finds a, a cup, what looks like a cup, full of what looks like a, a black liquid, which to the, it looks like to the touch, as though it's hot. I'll bet you he will, he's going to drink his cup of coffee, because if he doesn't drink his cup of coffee, he's not going to have any breakfast, he's not going to be, he may not have the strength to get to the university. But once he's had his appearance of breakfast and his appearance of a dining room, he's going to the, to the appearance of the garage where he's going to get into the appearance of his car and drive down the appearance of a road to the appearance of the university. He's going to live by the, the, the mind knowing what things are. In other words, he's going to live by his common sense in order to make a living by his nonsense in the university. Once he gets to the university, he's going to start talk, teaching his nonsense. Because the parents are so stupid that they're sending their children to quote-unquote universities where they learn stupidity and nonsense, which if, if the children took seriously would wreck their lives, make them lose the faith, make them lose God, make them lose, every, make them lose reality. A, a, a philosophy which they're only going to survive by not taking seriously. That's the situation. And who is king 
of all of the of the philosophy departments of all practically all modern universities answer Immanuel Kant. He's not named in Pashendi, but sure enough, that's that's who it is. And therefore, this this modern philosophy is deadly. And parents spend fortunes to send their boys and heaven knows even their girls to these wretched universities where they unlearn common sense, where they're going to lose their faith and where they're going to learn how to lose their souls. It's unimaginable. Um, Kant was followed by Hegel. Hegel was followed by somebody, I forget the name of the German theologian, because this philosophy, this ph why is philosophy so important? Philosophy passes now for ridiculous. And it is, the philosophy learnt and taught in most modern universities is absolutely ridiculous. It's got nothing to do with common sense, unless these moderns try to bring a bit of common sense through the back door, you know, which some of them do, which is honourable on their part, but they shouldn't have any truck whatsoever with this stupid nonsense. But they've lost their faith in their common sense. They've lost their faith in their sense of reality. They, they, instead of saying, this, is, this, is, this simply isn't a cat, it's a machine and it isn't living. For instance, according to the appearances, it's not living, there's nothing living about it, according to the appearances. The appearances tell me the reality, of course they do. The, the young man, when he's on his way to the university, he's never going to try to walk through, if he's in any room, he's never going to try to walk through the wall. He'll always walk through what looks like the door. And the door will open because it is a door. The wall will not open because it is a wall. And God gives you the common sense to realize which is a door and which is a wall. Oh no, not, not for moderns. That comes from God, that's reject to be rejected. And supreme advantage of this new philosophy, I am God, I am the creator because I put behind the appearances what I want. I don't want God. Therefore, I will absolutely refuse to put God behind the appearances of trees or animals or animal, vegetable, mineral, or whatever. I don't. The, the, so, so I can choose to completely create, recreate reality, and I am also free. I am completely free. This is the ultimate liberty: liberty from reality. It's the liberty of madness. What is somebody going to be who liberates himself from reality? It's almost the definition of a madman. And the modern world is a mass of madmen walking around as though they're normal. And in the modern world, they are normal. And they're absolutely nuts. They're basically, according to their principles, they're nuts. And this madness gets into the church, but it's a selective madness. So when I want my cup of coffee to be a cup of coffee, I say, this cup and this black liquid, it's a cup of coffee. I say it in all slim, I say, I say it just as though I'm saying, this microphone is a cat. You can't tell the difference because I'm just as convincing, I'm as convinced of the one thing as I am of the other. But in fact, in order to survive and in order to live, the modernists pay no attention to their own stupid, crazy, sick philosophy. But the churchmen pay attention to it. And thanks to, um, uh, thanks to Kant's principle, they empty out all the dogmas and they put in what they like. So, for instance, Karl Ratzinger. The dogma of the Incarnation is no longer Almighty God coming down to take flesh inside the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The dogma of the Incarnation is, is man becoming so perfect that he rises up to the level of divinity. What? That's the Incarnation. That may be, a, of course, Cardinal Rassing, when he wrote that nonsense, in, in his books of the, uh, principles of theology, whatever it was, 
uh, is, is dressed up in much more serious and pompous and clever and disguising language. But that's what it comes down to. The incarnation is not God coming down to man, but man rising up to God. Because the modern man can't understand anything that isn't centered on man. Therefore, the incarnation has got to be centered on man. It must be centered on God coming down. It's got to be centered on man going up. I mean, and, and so everything's going to be completely reinterpreted. Catholic theology is going to become absolute nonsense. That's, that's the, modern, the modern system. I'm caricaturing, I'm exaggerating, but essentially that's it. And, and, and then the rest of Pashendi is after the philosopher comes the theologian, the, the believer, who brings in, that's the, the, the believer bringing in what, he's, what he wants. And then the theologian is a com combination of the, belie of, the theolo of the philosopher wrecking all objective knowledge and the believer bringing in his subjective convictions. And that creates theology, modernist theology. The encyclical is, is brilliant. Um, it's not given, I think, nearly enough attention because people don't want to get to the roots of modernism. And then modernism disguises itself because um, uh, it, 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 uh, it, 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 cover, it does its best to cover its tracks so that you can't see the, 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 what's going on behind the appearances. So it may, it, modernism keeps up the appearances of Catholicism, but the substance is completely drained out. In all, in all domains. He goes through the philosopher, the believer, the, 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 philosopher, the theologian, which is the most important. Next after the philosopher. The philosopher is the most important because that's what's at the root of the whole nonsense. And this was a small group. In 1907, it was a small group of priests and laity. And they weren't yet very influential. They were very much in contact with one another. They were very much determined to introduce, to, to replace Thomas Aquinas by Kant, um, in effect Kant, and they, they were very much in contact with one. It was a network of stupidity and craziness and apostasy. And, it, and Pius X, in, in the encyclical, he's, um, he's, he's, a pope is not allowed to shout in an undignified way, but he's, Pope Pius X is screaming at the top of his voice this is this is the end of the road this is the this is this is ultimate madness this is simply crazy it's blasphemy it's apostasy you name it he's always dignified it's always very correct but he's trying to say how how sick and absolutely crazy this is so that that's kant that's pashendi and that's the modern church but I, I, I always quote a little an, an, from math, an example from mathematics. Two and two are four. Uh, three and three are six, and so on. So I say, I say, let's say to the equivalent of Cardinal Ratzinger, I say, uh, your, your your Eminence, because I will have respect for him for his office. I say, your Eminence, do you mind reciting me your t two times table? Of course I can. Then. Um, Two or two or four, he says. Three and three are six. Four and four are eight. Five and five are nine. Six and six are twelve. Seven and seven are fourteen. Eight and eight are sixteen. Nine and nine are eighteen. Ten and ten are twenty. How's that? I say yes. That 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 yes. That's fine. But uh, five and five are not nine. Five and five are ten. No, the aunt, he says. Oh, how do you know that five and five are nine? Because. I feel it. Oh, say I. All right, your eminence. How do you know that two and two are four? Because it's my feeling. Oh. So the whole of your two and two timetables is based on your feelings. Yes. Because the mind is... It's too dry, it's too rational, it's too impersonal. It's, I need a theology of feeling. I need a mathematics of feeling. 
but he's he's made most of his mathematics just like the ordinary mathematics. I couldn't have guessed what was up unless he made one mistake. If he hadn't made that mistake, if he'd said five and five are ten, I wouldn't have noticed there was any problem. So these modernists, they can they can dress things up in such a way that it looks just like the Catholic faith, but it isn't at all. It's resting on feeling. It's not resting on reality, objective reality, which is the same for everybody, and which imposes itself upon me, and which takes away my liberty to make to be creator. <coughs> Things are what they are, they're not what I make them. That's a statue, that's a cross, that's a cupboard, that's a yacht, a model yacht, those are bottles, etc. Reality is what it is. There was an Anglican bishop, butler of the 18th century in Ireland. He was Anglican, but he had a bit of common sense. And he said, things are what they are, their consequences will be what they will be. Why then should we seek to deceive ourselves? And the answer is because we want to remake the world in our own image. We want to be king. We want to kick out God. That's the size of it. I mean, could there be any greater disaster for the church than such a, such a proposition? But this is it. This is what modern people believe in. Two and two are four. That's just your opinion. They pretend, it's, they don't act as though it's just his opinion. Oh my, oh my, it, it's, it's very, to think about it is, is so disheartening because this is the madness that's got grip of men. But men corrupt their ways. They corrupt their minds, they corrupt their mathematics, they corrupt especially their theology. They go crazy, they make the world, they, they give free reign to the devil. They all, well, they all fall into hell. Almighty God has got to step in at some point to stop this. And it's getting so serious. Pius X, over a hundred years ago, was already, so to speak, shouting at the top of his voice. People didn't pay much attention. He saved the church. He gave the church a reprieve of, of another 50 years, from 1907 to 1958, when Pius XII died. Pius XII understood Pius X and had the same religion, the same objective True, to all, true, for, true for all time religion. But John the Twenty Third was, was uh, one who didn't want things to be what they are, didn't want the consequences to be what they, what they would be, and wanted to change everything in order to get rid of God, basically to make war on God. That's what it is. And to send all souls to hell. That includes John the Twenty Third. Oh, but he was a nice pope. Oh, but he was a... The headmaster who comes in after a strict headmaster and proceeds to loosen all the rules is not a nice headmaster. He's going to ruin the, the boys. Archbishop Vigano has said that the expulsion of truth is the cornerstone of modernity. But it now seems that the so-called Enlightenment project of naturalism and false reason that attacked and destroyed the medieval Christian social order is itself giving way to a postmodern horizon of woke cultural Marxism, radical psychoanalysis, anarchic environmentalism, globalist technocracy, nihilism, and all kinds of moral horrors. Initially, the revolution seemed to claim to stand for reason and nature. That was the so-called enlightenment. But how has rejection of God ultimately led to the extinguishing of reason and the rejection of the material universe itself as well? That's right. That's, that's basically right. Um, how has it led to it? Because if you undo the first stitch in a seam and then keep pulling on the, both sides of it, it, eventually every single stitch comes undone. And that's what, that's what modern man has done. At the time of Noah, the, the, the scholastics that say the, the church's philosophers with com, and theologians with common sense of the school of the Middle Ages, of the scholar, scholastics, the scholastics say, um, what was I going to quote? I've, I've lost it again, I've lost what was I going to quote. Um, they say they have a lot of sayings of common sense. And... Um, I forget what I was going to say, but, but the common sense is 
that if you continue pulling on a seam when the top stitch is undone, the whole thing is finally going to come undone. And what we've got today is that the whole seam, almost the whole seam has come undone. Still, the, milk, the, 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 the supermarkets are selling enough food for the people to eat. But any moment now, the supermarkets will, will, will collect dirt off the streets and package it in nice packages to sell it to the people. People are going mad. People are going mad. And mad, the madness is tearing everything to pieces. There's still the appearance of sanity, just like when a tree is dying, there's still a few leaves alive at the end of the branches, but the, the trunk is rotten. And it's simply a matter of time before the branches collapse and the leaves collapse because the trunk is collapsing. The, the mind is the... Yes, you, you, you need your mind to live every moment of the day because you need the mind to be reading what your senses, the sense data, what the sense data is giving you. This, my eye doesn't tell me that that's a piano. It's my mind that sees a very, a, a, an arrangement of brown which makes me say that is a piano. It's got what I know is a keyboard, and I know that I, I lift what looks like the lid, I'm going to find a set of keys. I know it's a piano, but uh, today people are just going mad, which is why they can't, they can't figure things out, they can't think, they can't r realize how they're being deceived by the COVID scam. They can't see through the criminal operations of, of those who rule the world, who are ruling the world, for its own destruction. They can't see any of that. Um, I, I forget, I'm sorry, I forget, forget your question. No, I think you've, um, you've answered that very well. Because they're going mad. They're going more mad by the day. And the madness is evident everywhere. And it's only the remains of this, of, it's the only the, re, sanity continues only in remains. And we're living off those remains. But the Freemasons and the followers of the Freemasons <clears throat> are destroying the remains of reality that they feed off and feeding off the remains that they're destroying. They're cutting off the branch on which they're sitting. Modern man is, is, is going to crash to the ground any moment. It, it, the crash, you can say, has started in Ukraine-Russia. The crash was the First World War. That was a good deal of crashing. Pashendi predated the First World War. The church was already internally undermined by these modernists. Or the threat of modernism was already starting. The disease was starting. After the, uh, the, the First World War was a, a severe dose of reality and people realised that the appearances are not as nice as we thought they were. The, the reality was the horror of trench warfare with shells and bullets and men torn to pieces and the youth, the flower of youth of the, of the European nations being killed. Um, that was the reality. And then the same thing happened with the Second World War and millions more than the First World War were killed. Even more of the appearances were, take, were, were destroyed. And now we're coming up to the Third World War, and it's going to be even more horrible. It's, the way, it's almost certain to end in nuclear war. How could it not? These people are crazy. I don't think Putin is crazy. I think Putin is... I think... I could be wrong. I think Putin is doing his best to stop the craziness. But if he goes on being goaded and attacked, and if the vile media go on presenting him as the villain then they're going to force him to use atomic bombs uh, or whatever. It's going to be nuclear warfare. And it's only a very harsh dose of reality which is going to bring people back to their common sense, including the existence of God, and that we come from God and that we're meant to go to God, and that God is the centre of our lives. In him we live and move and have our being, says St Paul. I and mean, that's what modern man is absolutely rejecting. He doesn't want it in his education. He doesn't want it in his children. He doesn't want it in his wife. He doesn't want it anywhere. He doesn't want God anywhere. And that's what he's going to achieve. And when he's achieved it, the devil will be complete master if God allows. 
And the devil would have every single soul down in hell, if God allowed. God is not going to allow, God will intervene in some way or another, like he intervened the corruption of Noah by the flood. And the flood was an act of great act of mercy, because without the flood, everybody would have been corrupted and fallen into hell, eventually. That's, that's original sin. Men are weak and they're foolish. It's, it's in us. It's not in us by God's fault. It, God made human nature perfectly sane and healthy, but Adam and Eve did a number, did a terrible job on hum, poor human nature. And it was, it, it, we, every one of us is born a wreck from, from, from birth, a virtual wreck, a potential wreck. And as he lives, usually most men sin and sin more, and eventually, unless they repent, if they repent, there's always God's mercy, and they can, they can go to heaven, but if they don't repent, they're going to fall into hell. That's, that's the game. That's the name of the game, so to speak. And nobody can back out of hell simply saying, by saying, I don't believe in a, in, a, in, a, in a life after death. My good friend, it doesn't matter whether you believe in it or not. The question is whether it is, is, whether it is. and it is. There is eternal life, whether you like it or not. Oh, my. You've talked about how modernity is characterised by a rejection of truth and is thus a crisis of the intellect, man's noblest faculty. But some writers have also commented on a deep crisis of the will today, how there is this growing atmosphere of postmodern exhaustion and ennui, where young people today, especially men, evince a loss of thumos or spiritedness, even towards natural or pagan objectives. Is this something you have seen? How is this phenomenon related to the deadly sin of pride and the deadly sin of acedia? Oh boy, again, you've got several questions here rolled up in one. Um, it's above all the deadly sin of pride. Uh, pride more than acedia, I would say. But, um, and it's, it's expressed by the Beatles once again. Uh, nothing is real, mind. Nothing to get hung about, will. Strawberry fields forever, a way of life. Following on the futility of the mind, the futility of the will, following on the futility of the mind, because it's the mind that informs the will. So if the mind is, is, is toppled, the will is... Uh, uh, up a creek without a paddle, as the Americans say. Uh, the will doesn't know what to do. It's going to, it's going to choose anything. And that's what modern man is doing. You choose anything. Because the mind is not saying this is right and that's wrong. This is true and that's false. The mind is not discerning. The mind is not reading anymore. The mind has taken vacation. It's lying back on a, <laughs> lying back on a soft chair in the sun. And the will is, is leaderless. And therefore the will collapses following on the mind. The mind needs, the liberation of the mind is the first step in chaos. And that, that's what Kant does with his philosophy. And it's radical. It's absolutely radical. I cannot know what's behind the appearances. In fact, what can I know? Um... So uh, the, the, the will is crippled as well. And that's one reason why the women take over. Because man is meant with his mind to lead the women. The women are strong in will, strong in emotion, strong in feeling, strong in heart. In it. And the women take over. And the women don't know where they're going or what they're doing, basically. Unless they have the faith which they can keep when the men lose it. They can still have the faith. If the woman keeps the faith when the man loses it, the woman can try to save the home and save her man. But if the man, if she loses her faith as well, it's more dramatic. When the man goes crazy, tiles fall off the roof. When the woman grows crazy, the foundations shake. The whole house comes down. Because she is the foundation of the house, with the, leadership, with the lead of her man. But if the mind of the man is not leading, the emotions of the women are all over the, all over the, all over the place. And so various other things you mentioned there. Um, go, go little by little. 
You notice today this sort of atmosphere of postmodern exhaustion, whether it's you know the listlessness of teenagers in a in a park. Yes. Uh, this the, where now they don't even have the the fumos to pursue natural objectives. That's the Beatles. There's, there's actually even now a loss of N nothing to come, nothing to get hung about. Not even fooling around with the girls still to get hung about. That's, that's, it's, it's, there's nothing there. I'm, I'm an empty, I'm a hollow man. I'm a hollow young man. I'm a hollow teenager. The teenagers didn't used to be hollow, but now they, now they are. And, and we're at the end of the line. This is what Pius X is sort of saying. In Pashendi, we are at the end of the line. It lasted for another hundred years from Pashendi, but now, 2022, we are really getting to the end of the line. It, this madness can't go on much longer. It's still going on. It, it's, but in the arts, you see, the, you see in the arts, we were talking about the arts, it's everywhere because it's all life. The mind has been wrecked. The whole of human life is wrecked because God gave us the mind to lead life. And we don't want to lead it God's way. We want to lead it our own way, which is in insanity, craziness, because we're made, we're made by God to go to God. That's the purpose of our existence. And a human existence well lived, like Pius X, is a wonder. Or an Archbishop Lefebvre, these men who lead their lives with the faith and in the light of the faith and obeying the faith, they can have a, 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 a marvelous life because th to follow God, to obey God, to love God, and to lead your life in accordance with the love of God makes is what life is meant to be. And, and when it is what it's meant to be, it's a marvel coming from God. But if you turn yourself against God, life becomes tragic, despairing, ridiculous, nasty, poor, brutish, and short. As Hobbes, uh, the English philosopher in inverted commas, wretched apostate, Thomas Hobbes said, oh, immediate heir of the, of the apostates that, that tore England away from the faith. An intelligent man, smart man, no doubt but faithless, absolutely faithless. I don't know much about Thomas Hobbes. All I know is he's one of these gray people. As that's, I'm, it seems to me, what I know of him is he's gray. And he's one of the villains. There have been a lot of villains, unfortunately, in England. England's had a real harvest of villains down the centuries. It was a merry England, but when it turned against the faith, it, it's become grey England. And what you're saying is then gay England. Gosh, what a horror. But it's inevitable. You turn away from God, that's what's going to happen. How have industrialism and urban living, particularly since the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century, helped a strange man from knowing and loving God? Because industrialism cuts off from nature, which is from God. God designed nature as where the where and wherewithal for man's life. Um, God, and for man's life, for him to live in such a way that he will go to paradise. He can go to paradise. But industry, which is man-made, I mean, nature is God-made. The horses, the trees, the clouds, the sun, the rain, all of these God-made things which man didn't design, which man didn't, didn't make, and which man can't make. Man can't make a horse. Only, only God's horses can make another horse of God. Uh, so so it's, it's machines are, are not part of, of God's nature. Machines are man-made. Nature is what is God-made. Machines are what is man-made. So the more machines there are in life, the less there is of God in life. A farmer used to live with the things of God all day long, with his wife, with his children, with his horses, with his mules, with his donkeys, with his animals, with his plants, with his fields. All of that is from God. It's nature. But then the more industry came in, and industry came in after Protestantism, and England was pioneer of the 
as England was one of the first nations to go most completely Protestant, so it was the first nation to go industrial. But the modern world has followed. All the modern world now wants the soft and sensual and independent life, pride and sensuality, the two great weaknesses of man, of, man, of fallen man. Uh, with pride and sensuality, I love the independence of nature from nature that, that machines give me and their, uh, their, their comfort, their sensual comfort, which they give me. A high material standard of living. I've got um, lights to do away with the night. I've got central heating to do away with the winter. I, I separate myself from nature. When I was at the seminary, a small measure of keeping nature was to turn on the central heating as late as possible in, in, the, in the autumn. The seminarians had a saint they prayed to to get the central heating turned on again. <laughs> but, you know, it was good for these American seminarians to get a dose of reality. And they, they, we had a wood boiler, and they cut the wood and, and looked after the boiler. It wasn't automatically, all automatically done with a switch. And it, just these little things, I think, helped. And not to have a washing machine. When, when the washing was done by hand, the seminarians had to work together, one, two, three, four, alongside, as a kind of process. To, and they used to talk together, and they used to sometimes sing together. Um, but a machine, you just load up the machine and then turn on the switch, and, and that's it. The wives used to, the husband used to have, to have to respect his wife because she spent all day laboring at cleaning the clothes and darning the clothes and preparing the meals and looking after the children. And now they, the, the women don't do, hardly do anything with those things. It's all, it's all done. Why, as a piece of clothing gets worn, you throw it away and buy the, buy, buy the cheap replacement at the, at the, at the local at the supermarket. The washing is done by the machine. Uh, soon they'll be inventing, which is needed, clearly, a machine to load the machine. Uh, still, at this moment, people have to humanly load the, the washing machine. And they resent having to do the loading. They're waiting until somebody invents a machine that will load the machine. Modern man is lazier and lazier physically, um, more and more idle, less and less natural, more and more mechanical, and so on and so on and so on. I mean, now electronics, and so on and so on. Of course, it, it's you, it's not practice, simply not practical to try to go back to horses because if I wanted to go by horse to London, I would need hay, hay stations instead of petrol stations all the way to London. I don't know how often a horse needs some more hay, but I'd have to have horse stations all the way to London. They obviously they're no longer they're no longer there. They were there once, but they're certainly not there now. I couldn't get to London on a horse, so it's not practical to do away to to do away overnight with all the cars and with all the aeroplanes. But that's exactly what God might do. That's what some prophecies say God is going to do when He intervenes with this intervention that's coming. He's going to do away with the machines. Because if the machines are still there, people are still going to be cut off from his nature, his environment, and his way of life designed to help us to get to his heaven. It's all going to be... Modern man can't live with these machines. In theory, they're all neutral. In theory, it's never any of their fault. And of course, it, it, it never is any of the machines' moral fault. They do, they're only machines. They can't have a moral fault. They can't, the machines can't sin. It's got to be the human beings that sin in the way they use the machines. That's, that's where the sin is. But the machines, nevertheless, make very easy a lot of sinning. So they're going to they're gonna have to be done away with. And the problem with the time after the chastisement is that the men are going to, the survivors of the chastisement who knew the, this epoch now are going to remember a lot of the machines and they're going to rebuild the machines because they made life so much easier. Easier physically, easier comfortably, easier by night, easier by winter. 
and they will remake the machines and the whole process will start up again and they will roll to the Antichrist. The last two decades has seen the domination of the internet and the rapid proliferation of personal electronic devices to the extent that now every de dimension of daily life seems to depend on them. What has been the effect of these changes on the soul of man? Well, again, you're rolling, <laughs> you're rolling several questions into one. Uh, you, you're tying the questions one to another. What was the first question again? The um, effects of the proliferation yes, of that's right. electronic devices. More and more sense of independence from God. More and more sense of man being king, man being God, man being in control. I can, how many things I can do, I, I, I can credit myself with a certain kind of omnipotence when I've got a, a smartphone in my hands. The smartphone is a relatively recent in, invention. It's spread all over the world now. And you can see, obviously, you, you go, you stand at a bus stop and, and a high proportion of those standing in queue or standing at the same bus stop are looking at machines, looking at these machines. They're living in electronics. They're feeding on electronics. We're right now making a, a show for electronics. I mean, the, 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 the cameras and, and the, the recording is for the purposes of being able to ship out electronically to all kinds of people what, what, I, what I think or how things seem to me. Uh, so I'm using electronics right at this moment, I'm seriously using electronics. Uh, and of course, that, again, that's common sense. I mean, if I, if I wanted to, if I insisted on doing without electronics, uh, I'd have a very, there'd be a very small audience, an insignificant audience. In fact, I like to, if I can, to do without a microphone in a, inside a church, because I, I prefer that there be the immediate human contact from one at both ends, both those listening and, the, and, the, and whoever is speaking, me speaking. But there are a number of priests who, who like, you notice that they like a microphone as a kind of protection. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of barrier between them and the people. So you've got the proliferation of machines and the proliferation of electronics separating people from God. And you've got the old-fashioned way of life without machines disappearing, steadily disappearing. And men want more and more machines to do more, more and more things so that they can be more and more independent of God. I, I, I think that's what drives it. You've mentioned the, these technologies which um, are situated within our day-to-day -day lives and uh, drive the modern way of life. But I wonder if you can comment on the significance of those technologies now which, um, which mean that men occupy a virtual space. They create a virtual space. For That's... Yes, but, like video games, social yep. media, where now that men are even stepping back from contact with reality itself yep. and spending a large yep. portion of their lives. It's called virtual reality. virtual reality, and it's not real reality. And obviously people live so much in virtual reality, they, they live so much now with smartphones and with electronics of various kinds, that they are more and more cut off from real reality. And virtual reality substitutes for real reality. And man thinks, I'm doing all of this and not God. There's nobody above me or outside of me or over me who controls me and has, tells, has the right or the, even the ability to tell me what to do. And I'm on, I'm, I can do as I like. That's the sense that these machines give. And it's driving people crazy. They're, they're separating from reality which shows in all kinds of remarkable ways. And the journalists steadily pick up some example or another of, uh, for instance, a youngster who can hardly still walk. Youngsters who, children in the schoolroom, 
who did no longer respond to real teachers. They, all, they wrote, all they can respond to is a screen, a teacher on a screen. There's so many cases, so many examples, and it's all insane. In the end, for instance, give me, let me give you an example. The, the, the music recording industry. There are some marvellous machines for now register, recording music and for reproducing it. And the machines are of higher and higher quality. And men work on making the quality even better. But at the, in the end, it's always depending on some human being. A violinist playing a violin, recording a violin sonata, an orchestra with a number of human beings and a conductor. All of them have instruments. But it, the music comes from the human beings. And all of the industry of reproducing that music mechanically, re reproducing it with machines, depends upon the human behind it all, at the centre of it all. And if you haven't got the Beatles, these four young men unloading their horror at the unreality of the world surrounding them, strawberry fields forever, and turning to drugs, because that's all, that's all that they have, paradise coming out of their bloodstream. That's all that, that's the only paradise that's left to them, the only paradise they can still believe in. It's a material paradise, because it's a material drug that I materially swallow, and that's, that's the only paradise that I believe in. So, but it's, it's a human being needing paradise. He's, he needs paradise. It's a human need. It's not a mechanical thing. And machines can't do it. And, and education needs a, a human being teaching hu human children. Human children can't be taught by machines. It's not an education. It's a technical formation, which is not the same thing as an education. And so on and so on and so on. It, I, I, I keep saying the same things, but... Um, there's, a, there's a, a great, I think I mentioned yesterday, Letters from the Underground by Dostoevsky, which I've come, had, had to come across again recently. And Dostoevsky is saying in the middle of the, in the, middle of the, 90, of the middle of the 1800s, the 19th century back in St. Petersburg, he's one of those who, one of the first lit, writers of literature to try to describe humanly the modern big city. Baudelaire was another, the French poet. And they're coming to terms with the modern big city, which is cold and inhuman, mechanical, man-made. And it, this, the poor, the man from the underground is living in this half basement, uh, you know, at, at the street level with half below the street and only half above the street. He's living alone there and he's living this, this lonely life. He's got no family and, and he's super sensitive. And he's got some sort of, sort of friends. It's very, it's a, it's a great book, and and it, and there, there's there are famous pages and um, some great pages, where some, some, where what am I saying? Where Dostoevsky, novelist Dostoevsky, not Saint Dostoevsky, he's not a saint. He didn't have the Catholic faith, for instance. He did have faith in Christ, yes. And he didn't like what was going on in the 19th century Catholicism in Europe because he saw that the, the religion was being rotted. He, already, he picked it up at that time already. So um, he, um, he says you, could, you can drown a human being in prosperity to the point that only the bubbles are still coming up. Prosperity, comfort, all of these things which machines provide, which the 19th century was providing, beginning to provide, which has only gone on to provide even more and more in the 20th and 21st centuries. And he said, you can drown him in all that. He's going to react. He's going to react. He's going to throw off the prosperity. He's going to throw off the comfort. He's going to throw off all of this simply to show that he's not a machine that can be controlled by material comfort and material prosperity. Simply to affirm something in his humanity which is too precious for him and which, which he's going to defend. 
simply in order to show that he's not a machine. And of course, that's absolutely true. And that's why, that's a lot to, uh, that's why the hip is. That's where the boys come from with spike orange hair, you know, they, they, they've got to show that they are who they are. They've got to affirm that, that you know, they don't, they're not made content by what everything that, that, that modern schools, modern universities, modern homes, uh, modern politics are, uh, can offer them. And politicians are, are the masters of, of the, these, these human reactions, these secret human reactions, but human reactions going on inside. And the politician who can express that is the one that's going to be voted for. Well, the one who can give voice to what they, what they as human beings want, which is not just sensuality and pride, the satisfaction of sensuality and pride. It's not just sin. There are needs of nature, of human nature, which can't be satisfied by machines and so on. And, and that's, modern man is trying to satisfy spiritual needs by material means. You can't do it. It cannot be done. But if I admit that there is such a thing as spirit, which is independent of matter and above matter, then I've got to start looking for very different solutions from merely material solutions. I don't want to do that. I'm, I, in things spiritual, I'm completely ignorant. So I, I, I will try to, 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 to turn everything into something material. I, psychiatry, psychology, they're trying to turn the spiritual into something material which they can then handle with mathematics and science and, and things material, with, with drugs and so on. You can't do it. You can't raise children with what, what rhin, ritinol, ritinol, what some of those drugs with which they try to, to d d damp down kids that are reacting. The kids are reacting because they, they need... They, they, they need what nobody any, any longer still understands that they need. So who can give it to them? How then can they be satisfied? They're going to go crazy to the point that you've got to tie them down with a straitjacket. And then the point comes where you say, we've got to depopulate. We can't... Th this situation is unhandleable. We've got to depopulate. That's COVID. And therefore, humanity steps into... Mass suicide. That's where we're at. The church has the answer to all of these things because we come from God. There's one true God. We come from him. We're all the soul of every single human being. Every single human being. Atheist, Jew, Mohammedan, communist, all of them, all of us come from God. God alone can create the, the spiritual soul which animates the physical body to make a live human being. We all of us come from God, only from God's purpose, God's purposes and in God's mind, only for us meant to go to God in paradise for eternity, to be happy ourselves and to make him happy by having shared his happiness. But we don't want it. We don't want what God wants. And therefore we go on trying to satisfy spiritual needs, pretending the spirit doesn't exist, and trying to, that's Marx, you know, the spirit doesn't exist, religion is the opium of the people, uh, and so on and so on. And trying to turn everything into a material problem so that we can, we can solve it with our mat brilliant material means. So man has never been so much the master of matter and so little the master of himself, of his own soul, of his own humanity as today. How does the current technocratic paradigm, the age of the machine, leave people vulnerable to manipulation by the enemies of the church? Because they're completely ignorant of things of the spirit, whereas the manipulators still have a sense of what human beings are and need. They themselves want power. They themselves are going to get themselves power. And they're going to cater for what they know of the human beings who are not going to be kings like them, but slaves like all the Gentiles. All the Gentiles are going to be slaves, and the non-Gentiles are going to be kings, and the kings have a master of human nature, and they know what is needed to keep the slaves enslaved. 
And that's what they're planning on. And the first step to keep the slaves enslaved is to not let them be too numerous, which is why a first step for the sinister masters is to depopulate, to seriously reduce the whole world population. That's what they're planning on. That's what they're doing. And that's what the COVID injections have done. Killed a huge number of people that didn't have to be killed. The church honors life because it loves life. It loves, love, it loves God. And there's plenty of room in the universe for 9 million, or was it 7 billion, 8 billion, 9 billion people. There's, there's plenty of room. If only men will choose to use it rightly. There's not a problem of overworld population in any kind of, of any kind. But there is a huge problem of undereducation, of false education, of miseducation, because the church is not doing the teaching. There's a huge need of the church to explain to human beings who they are, where they come from, and where they're meant to be going, which is God. And only God can satisfy the dimensions of the human soul. The human soul is so potentially huge that God alone can satisfy. That's what St. Augustine says. Oh God, we are restless, our souls are, we are, we are restless, and we are restless until we find our rest in thee. Only God can satisfy. So big is the human being. It's true that he is big, but his bigness corresponds to God. Marx wants to make the bigness correspond to, to man, and so on and so on. You can't do it. Man is much more than just man. And it's not thanks to man that he's much more than just man. And it never will be thanks to man that he's much more than just man. It can only be thanks to God. He's got to, to turn back to God to solve all of these problems. Like, for instance, the wife being submitted, submissive to her husband. This life, it, it, she, she, she is meant to be submissive to him in this short life. Because she won't, be, she won't have to be submitted to him in eternity, where all souls will be equal before God. Before God, they will be equal. The, so the, but man has a sense of the need for that equality. He's a sense for the, he wants that equality. But he wants to fit that equality into this, that, that heaven-dimensioned di equality, into this little life. So he's going to cram equality he's going to force equality upon all things all kinds of situations in this life where equality doesn't belong god's creation is loaded with inequality with variety to show the variety of god to reflect all of his only a part of of course of his own variety but the the variety of the of the creatures expresses the variety of God much better than, than the absolute equality of all, all creatures would. What, what if, all, if all flowers were the same? If all flowers were roses, because roses are the best of flowers, well, in that case, the, the garden would be much more boring than, than it is with a huge variety of flowers, including even the miserable dandelion, <laughs> which, which succeeds in planting itself everywhere and imposing itself. But... It's a creature of God which has its own purpose. So God has his purpose in mosquitoes and snakes and dandelions. Almighty God knows what he's doing. We don't always know what he's doing, but he knows. So. How might Catholic families today minimize or avoid the mind-mushing effects of the modern artificial world and raise children who love God and are sensitive to his truth, goodness and beauty? Um, I have a simple answer to that, a very simple answer, a classic answer, which is the rosary. Let the young couple install from the very beginning of their marriage, even before it, the rosary. Five, five mysteries, and let the two adults, the two young adults, 15 mysteries if they can, if it's possible. It's a lot more, but... And it may not be practical. But 15 Misty Rosa is very powerful to keep one's head above the, the confusion. I don't know how and I don't know why, but I'm sure that it's an efficacious remedy to stop the mind and heart being confused. If a man will go on celebrating, reciting 15 mysteries a day with all his heart and mind, his life will change. 
and he will get himself out of the mess as, as far as he can. He will then draw his wife out of the mess. The husband and wife will draw the children out of the mess. They will immunize the children against even confusion in their schools. They will come back, the children will come back at home. They'll be debriefed. There will be no television in the home, no elect as, as few electronics as possible in the home, as few electronics as possible, as practical. And the children, by the ch parents taking time with them and debriefing them, for instance, from a bad school, with them, and there may be no other than a bad school available, but by debriefing and taking time with the children, the children will be immunized against all kinds of problems outside.